Okay, this is part four of the If I Could Go Back and Tell Myself What I Know Now series. This is a hypothetical conversation with my younger self. All right, so you're looking at all your books and such, Michael, and you're preparing your way to get to financial freedom. And while you're practicing, uh, the question is going to be is when do you leave demo trading? Or at the time when we first started, it was paper trading. So when am I ready for live funds? It begins with proof of concept. Proof of concept. You have to show minimum of six months consistency. Manage to keep risk below 3% maximum. Unemotionally weather strings of losses. So when to leave demo? First and foremost, you have to have proof of concept. Now you're going to be doing a lot of things. You mean buying a lot of books. And I wish I could tell you to save all that money. Because you're going to have over 2,000 books and less than a dozen of them were really worth the time reading. A lot of it's going to be regurgitated things. So you want to focus on the following things. If you do this, Michael, you're going to be able to fast track your way to get through a lot of the hardships that, you're, that you will unknowingly enter yourself into and chase and pursue things that are going to lead to more loss and confusion. The first thing you're going to be focusing on is seasonal tendencies. You want to ignore the things that Jake Bernstein talks about. Uh, the more research group that puts out seasonal tendencies. This person has the best seasonal tendencies. MRCI.com is the website. You're going to find that if you stick to that gentleman's seasonal tendencies, they're going to serve you exceptionally well. Quarterly shifts. You're going to be looking for moves that move every three to four months. Now, the markets always have some specific gyration, but focusing primarily on the major moves that should transpire over the next three to four months. If you focus there, you're going to find a lot of these mega trades. Monthly bias. Try to formulate all of the things that you're doing every single day to get in sync with the monthly bias. What is the monthly bias likely to do? Is it likely to trade higher? Is it likely to trade lower? Focusing within that particular bias, within a specific quarterly shift, within a specific seasonal tendency, is going to give you the highest odds probability of success than anything you're going to read in any of the books that you buy. So if I could grab you and shake you by the lapels, Michael, this is exactly what I would stress to you because everything that you're doing prior to identifying this is creating the problem. All the frustrations you're feeling, all the I want to know where it's going next, this is the three things that helps figure that out for you. But it's going to be years before you discern that. But if I could convince you right now, this is what I would tell you to do. Focus on these top three things. Once you have that determined, then you can focus on a weekly profile. Now, if it's bullish, then you're expecting to have a weekly profile that's bullish. At the time of this recording, uh, you're world-renowned for knowing and teaching how the weekly bias and weekly range is typically formed with the higher low formed generally by Tuesday's London Open, if not by Wednesday. So if you can focus on that seasonal tendency that's bullish or bearish, and you're looking for that quarterly shift that's in line with that seasonal tendency, and you have factored into what the monthly bias should be in concert with those two previous ideas, your weekly profile should be in alignment as well. So you're not trying to go against the underlying momentum. You're trying to get in sync with the institutional order flow. Once you identify the seasonal tendency and you're focusing on a quarterly shift or a 
price swing that should transpire over the next three to four months, and your monthly bias is determined to be bullish or bearish relative to those seasonal tendencies in the next quarterly shift, and you're working with any weekly profile that's bullish or bearish relative to the idea of that monthly bias and quarterly shift and seasonal tendency, the daily template, that means what type of day are we going to have? Did we just come off of a big range day? Or a series of big range days because we're probably going to contract and go into small ranges but if we do go into a small range it's going to be a short-term event then it should lead to a large expansion in the direction of the monthly bias in the expectation of the quarterly shift that you're looking for and within alignment of the seasonal tendency the daily template is basically your power three concept where it's the open high low and close formation of the daily bar you're looking for accumulation manipulation and distribution you want to spend a lot of time studying time of day London Open has specific characteristics that generally make the higher low of the day not all the time but most of the time New York is a continuation of whatever has transpired in London unless you've reached a higher time frame level or key level that may introduce a New York session market reversal profile. London close is typically the opposite end of the daily range or will be opposing the higher low formed in London open. Focusing on a time of day within all these specific studies are going to put you in the highest order of probability. Doesn't mean you're going to not take losses. You will. But sticking to this in this protocol is going to lead to the longest stretch of consistency and continuity in your trading than you're ever going to find doing anything else. Minimum six months consistency. Now, I understand you're excited and you see there's a lot of things ahead of you, Michael. And you've made that plan of retiring at 40. And newsflash, you get there. <laughs> but try not to rush profits. There's going to be a transition. You don't know when it's going to occur, but it is when you start trading the bond market. The bond market starts serving you very well, and then you discover that you can do far more per week than you could with just one lot by using more money management. And the enticement is going to be get there quicker, get there quicker. And you discover the power of compound interest, but you don't at that time understand the depths that it can take you down with. It's very powerful, but it's a double-edged sword. So if I could change your mind about something speaking to you now, uh, you should do your best to try not to be profitable or rush profits. And what do I mean by that? Taking more trades than necessary. In other words, your trade frequency, Michael, when you first start is going to be horrendous. There's going to be days where you actually have taken 30 entries and none of them are profitable because you're going back and forth, back and forth, thinking you're going to get the right direction right and it's not going to work out for you. This is the reason why you have to work with the previous information where you work from a macro perspective down. If you do that, you will also be more controlled over your decision making and you won't be in a rush to make profits. Rushing to profit is the surest, fastest way to lose money. It doesn't feel like it, especially when you're buying all these books because all these books are sugarcoating everything. They're over simplifying everything and giving you a false sense of security because of these indicators. And the indicators are not the secret. Those indicators are just the red herring and the gimmick that that book's using to sell. Keep the monthly return as the focus. Now you're going to be trading, starting with commodities, and you're focusing on the dollar amount. How much can I make today? How much money can I make this week? And as soon as you take that first loss for the month, this is when you go into a tailspin because you're in a hurry to get that back. You don't like taking losses. And I want you to understand something. 
27 years from now, you're going to be able to look back and count up an enormous amount of money that if you collectively add it all up, all of your losses are enormous. And there is nothing wrong with that because every trader loses, but you got to keep the focus on the monthly return. It doesn't make a difference if you have three losing trading days out of the week or you had no winning positive days for the week, but you come out ahead on the monthly. If your monthly return is consistently higher than 1%, you're doing exceptionally well. It doesn't feel like it. It doesn't sound like it. You think that everyone that's super elite is doing 500% per month because that's the impression that these books that you're buying and wasting money on, Michael, are giving you. They don't do that. They aren't making those types of returns and you want to be able to focus primarily on what you've done over the course of four weeks or so. And that result and that return is your goal. You're not trying to get an everyday percentage. You're not trying to get an every week percentage. You're looking at how you close each month. And is this month positive? Because if it's positive, that's better than a loss. And if you continuously do that, you're going in the right direction. But try not to rush profits and try not to look beyond the scope of what your monthly return is. Invite the possibility of being wrong. I understand obsessive compulsive disorder. We struggle with it and we still struggle with it in our 40s. But I want you to understand something, Michael. You are not going to be right 100% of the time. And early on, the first couple of years, you're spending time trying to perfect and eliminate the possibility of you being wrong. And it's a farce. Don't do that. You're going to waste time doing that. There is no perfect person. There is no perfect trader. And you still, with almost three decades of experience, I'm speaking to you now, you are still not perfect. Your exits aren't perfect. Your entries aren't perfect all the time. Perfection is still going to evade you. But you do not need perfection. When you're wrong, many times that's going to lead to a more profitable trade or identifying that you're wrong and getting out and staying on the sidelines preserves your capital. By preserving your capital, you don't go into spending your mental capital. And the mental capital is how much money you're really willing to lose. You may have $20,000 in that trading account, but you're really not comfortable if you lost 5,000 of it. So what are you really trading with? $5,000. But the $20,000 is just lipstick. The extra $15,000 is padding that you hope you never go into. And as soon as you do, everything gets abandoned. The trade plan, the methodology, all of that goes out the door. Risk management, trade management, all of it tossed out because now you're emotional and you can't act that way. Invite the possibility of being wrong. Identify the characteristics that leads to your trade idea being wrong. Identify it before you even put the trade on. So in other words, what negates the idea? What makes it most likely to fail? If those trades show signatures of that occurring, do not hesitate. Just simply close the trade, preserve capital. If you do that, you will be on a fast track to preserving your mental capacity, your willingness to stay studying even though you're not taking trades if you don't do this you're going to find yourself going into the longest tailspin in terms of pursuing something that is eluding you because you're causing it you're trying to be perfect and it won't exist it won't ha it won't happen you're not going to be there that will always evade avoid chasing parabolic equity surges I can recall many of the things that we did and there's some of those instances where it worked out in our favor but most of the time it didn't <laughs> so avoiding parabolic equity surges is one of the things that it's going to be very hard for you because the first one you get with Chicago Board of Trade wheat that sets the stage for you thinking that you can do this every week and it doesn't work that way Avoid trying to allow your account to grow exponentially with these parabolic equity surges where you're getting 100 plus returns 
quickly. Try not to do that because number one, you have to have the right market conditions. You have to have everything on point, your entry, your stop, your trade management, your exits. There are so many things that have to line up for you to deliver with Olympic level equity surges on a consistent basis. It's not realistic going into this. Now, it's going to eventually get to the point where you can see these things and predict them, but it won't be in the first few years. You're going to make the mistake in believing that you're better than you really are far before you really get a, on what it is that you should be doing as a trader. Reduce leverage when taking losses. Now this is something that I can remember we did very poorly. When we would take losses, you would increase the amount of contracts trying to recapture and get more equity back in the account because we didn't like the way it felt when money was taken out. Not only did we not like the fact that we were wrong, but we didn't like the fact that we were wrong and we were robbed of equity. And we personified that and made it someone or something that we're going to get revenge on. And that I can look back and say that that was 90% of the biggest losses and the biggest and longest streaks of losing trades were linked to that very thing. If we would have just simply reduced the leverage, for instance, if we were trading 10 contracts of the Standard & Poor's futures contract and we took a loss of 2%, the next trade should be 5 lots. And if we take a loss there, next trade should be 2 lots and keep reducing until you make 50% of the previous loss back. Then you can go back up one scale in the money management and risk trade management. But if you don't do this, you're going to have a wild roller coaster equity swings and many accounts being dusted. If you don't do this, you're not going to build in plateaus in your equity. There's going to be a series of winning trades and then what's going to eventually come that you don't like to admit it's going to be a losing trade or two or three and if you keep risking the same amount your equity drawdown is going to be notable and horrendous if you don't control yourself so you want to reduce the leverage after taking losses because the in the inevitable is going to happen you're going to have a series of losses but if you keep risking two percent two percent two percent two percent it's going to have greater impact on the drawdown that you suffer and it's much more work on your part to recapture that. Be patient while drawdown recovery. Losing still sucks. When you get stopped out, it's not fun, but it's a business transaction. Eventually, around the late 20s, you're going to see it as just that. It still won't feel good and you'll hate that you have them, but you'll come to grips with it a little bit. But be patient with drawdown recovery. In other words, don't rush to get it back. If you have a day trade or two that shows a net loss for the day, stop. The next trading day, it's very easy to start building that back up. And don't try to get it back in one trade. You have made so many errors, I can tell you right now, at least three dozen of them. And they were all in soybeans. Those trades ended up being parlayed into huge losses and two lost accounts. You killed two accounts. You don't see it yet. <laughs> oh, but it's coming. You will have blown two futures accounts trading the soybean market because you're trying to get back your losses and you get caught in a couple limit moves and you can't get out of those and you end up suffering and blowing out the account because you are not being patient you're not going to be patient and you suffer. The drawdown and the recovery of it is not on a timeline basis. In other words, there's no deadline that you have to meet to get that money back. Immediate is what you feel like it has to be. But that's the trap. That's the trap. You have to avoid that. Michael, if you don't listen to me, you're going to find yourself chasing loss after loss 
after loss. And you're not going to be thinking clearly. You're going to get even more insanely ra enraged. Okay, it's what it's going to become. Because you think that the broker's on the other side clicking buttons just to get you. And I can tell you, honestly, looking back, you were just doing it wrong and doing it wrong a lot. And very frequently pursuing something that is very easily accepted. Take the loss, go home for the day, and see what happens tomorrow. If you don't do that, you're going to dust multiple accounts. Manage to keep risk below 3% maximum. Avoid large risk for large wins. Now, when you first start trading, you're going to read a couple things in Commodity Magazine, and it's going to inspire you to trade with a little bit larger risk. And you're going to pull out your calculator, and you're going to be sitting at lunch while at work, and you're going to think, if I take my account and I risk 8, 10, 12% per trade, I can do this or that in the time of the end of the month. If I do that 12 months in a row, I'll be able to buy this or that. Don't do that. Avoid large risk. You're not going to be consistent in the beginning. You think you are because the books that you bought are telling you that it's just simply just do this, do that. And when the indicator says this, that's when you buy. And when the indicator says this, you sell. And you're going to find out very quickly that it doesn't work that way. It's, <laughs> it's not that easy. Expect to make velocity your edge. After spending almost 28 years doing this, I can tell you everyone still thinks that having a large R multiple, okay, or risk to reward model is the secret. And that's not the secret. The secret is velocity. Doing something over and over and over again that has an expected result that is high in probability and flipping the equity, that's velocity. You will, in your mid-30s, discover how you can take the same account balance and while other traders and other methodology may be focusing on trying to get 10 to 1 or more, you can do exceptionally well doing one to one, two to one. Because you can use the lower time frames that you don't appreciate right now, but they are the same market with dozens of setups per day. But you're not in a position when you first start to start doing those types of trades. It's going to be a little bit of time before you understand that, but velocity and turning over the equity without risking a lot that beats every race it beats every trading contest it beats everything period because you're using the rate of turnover in the equity because you're taking more frequency and you're looking at a result that is measurable it's a repeating reoccurring pattern that, that forms every single day multiple times intraday so it's not that the, you want to take a larger risk to make bigger money. You want to take surgical strikes and parlay the account up using velocity. And it's just a higher frequency trade of a same reoccurring pattern on a lower time frame. And while other traders are waiting for their 10 to 1, 21, 30 to 1, that money can only make whatever the maximum our multiple is going to be for it. But within those long or higher time frame price swings, you're going to be in there moving back and forth both directions, most of the money being allocated to the side of the marketplace it's going to move in and still trading counter trend intraday with less than the risk that you're using when you're trading in sync with the market. And you will destroy the 10 to 1, 21, 31 R multiple type trading models. It's simple math, but you're going to be distracted, Michael, by all these books and all these things that are going to draw your attention away from the simplest of things. 
Is it going to go up? Is it going to go down? How far is it going to go up? How far is it going to go down? At what point is it incorrect and I want to be out of the trade? Now, that same criteria, just applied to a one minute or five minute chart, you can take that same equity and flip it over and over and over and over again. Within the span of, say, a weekly range that takes five candles to form, you may have 30 to 40 trades for the course of the week, and they're all one minute setups. But if each one of those pay out 2% minimum, nothing's going to keep up with that. Consider the negatives of forcing setups. Your impatience, Michael, in the beginning, because the first trade you put on, you lose 50% of your equity and your trading options. And you didn't fully understand what you were doing. And option trading is not just simply being right on the marketplace. You have to beat the time decay as well. You'll learn about that later on with some pain. <laughs> but consider the negatives of forcing the setups because you're going to try to force it. You're going to have a level that you want to be buying at, but you are impatient and you're going to try to buy it ahead of time. And that is a problem because you aren't very versed in proper stop placement in the beginning, Michael. You're going to have your stop too tight because you don't want to risk a lot of money, but you are risking 5% on the trade, and that's too much. You're risking way too much, but you're forcing the entry sooner than it should be taken, and it is done at a time where you're using the maximum amount of leverage, which strangles the trade because you have to have a very short, tight stop in a trade that you entered too soon before the level you want to buy at. So when you're doing that, you're convincing yourself that you're going to be right and ignoring all of the things that you're doing wrong that is inviting failure. You have to consider the negatives of it. What is the impact of that? Number one, you're teaching yourself that not following the rules is okay. That trading ahead of the level before it's made a touch or a retest to it, that that's normal. That's something you should be doing when it doesn't fit within the model. If you've identified a level and you want to buy at that level, why are you buying before the level's hit? Because you're forcing the trade. You're impatient. You want to get in because you're afraid that you're going to miss the move. It might not hit your level. Well, guess what? So what? There's going to be tens of thousands of trades in your career. And you're not going to miss the big money maker because of not getting in early. Getting in early is always, always, I can tell you now looking back, has always been an error. Always. It never works out in our favor, so don't do it. Taking partials is the best thing you will ever do. And I'm going to say it again. Taking partials is the best thing that you're ever going to do, Michael. The biggest hurdle in your development is being comfortable with holding the trade. You're going to struggle with that. It's going to cause anxiety. You're going to have heart palpitations. You're going to have shortness of breath. You're going to feel like you're going to faint a couple times. You're going to vomit a couple times because some of the trades that you're in in the S&P are huge. And just the smallest little tick is making you go nuts. Wait around for it. It happens. <laughs> but taking partials off while the trade is developing, number one, it feels good to take something off. It feels good. And it feels like you're doing something because even when you're in a trade that's winning, you're going to find that it is like holding on to a motorcycle at 200 plus miles an hour. It's an it's a incredible rush. But you also want the ride to end sometimes quickly. And when you get in a trade and it's moving in your favor, you want it to get there quick. You want it to get there and get you out of the trade and profit because you don't like the discomfort of not knowing if it's going to hit your target. So the way you're going to best deal with that 
and have the ability to hold on to the trade longer into fruition or to get stopped out because that's part of the plan too. You have to take something off. So if the trade moves 10 points in your favor, take 10 points off with something. If, even if it's one contract or one lot, take something off. It feels good. It's that cookie, that reward. When it moves a little bit more, take something off again. And you're going to find by doing that, it helps alleviate the pain and uncertainty of holding on to that trade until it gets to your profit objective. Taking partials reduces risk while paying. You're going to worry in the beginning about getting stopped out all the time. And you're going to do a lot of acrobatics with your, your stop loss. You're going to move it back when you think it's dropping against you or raise it up when it's rising back up towards your stop. And you're going to drive yourself crazy doing that. You have to commit to whatever your stop is going to be based on sound money management and risk. And once the trade starts moving in your favor, take partials off. By doing that, not only does it fund you as the trader, but it also reduces the risk. Because every time you take something off, you're reducing the exposure that your account and your and your mental capital will withstand. So you have to constantly manage not only the trade, but you have to manage the trader and its expectation. Your expectation is you put the trade on because you want to be profitable. So what's the best thing that you can do as a trader when the trade's in profit? Take something off. Don't be fearful and don't allow greed to say, oh, I have to hold on for everything. It's all or nothing. Because I'm going to tell you, Michael, when you do that in the first couple of years, you're going to be in some trades. For instance, coffee. You're going to be holding on to a coffee trade that's going to move a lot. It's going to move a lot. And $35,000 turns into an $8,000 loss because you wanted to get your full target. <laughs> you have to listen. You have to listen to this. If you don't do these things, Michael, you're going to regret it. Taking partials is the best thing you're ever going to do. And taking partials reduces risk while paying you. Ignore unprofitable trader's advice on risk. If someone that you read, if someone that you listen to says anything against what's being said to you right here, I would put a million dollars on them not being a profitable trader. Chances are they have no idea what it is to be consistent. They probably had hit and miss type results, but consistent long-term trading results come by way of funding the positions and funding the trader, or as we say it today, pay the trader. If you don't do those things, there's nothing guaranteeing, Michael, that your trade's going to hit your target. There's absolutely nothing guaranteeing that. And the volatility in today's world, which at the time of this recording, we've seen some pretty dramatic volatility. And your trades, every time you put them on, there's no guarantee that you're going to hit your objective. So you have to get to the point where you trust yourself and you don't rely on other people's advice about risk because their advice about your risk is free to them. There's no exposure. And the advice they're giving you probably isn't sound. So stick to what I'm telling you here. Commit to it and own it. Your losses are your losses. Your wins are your wins. No one else can take credit for it, and you shouldn't try to share credit. Weather series of consecutive losses. Taking losses is normal, Michael. It doesn't feel good. It sucks. But, unfortunately, there's simply no way around it. Every trader loses money, every trader suffers drawdown, professional traders manage how much, and they understand they don't know how long it's going to take before it turns the equity around, in other words, the recovery. You will lose fortunes. Expect the pain. The faster you can accept this, Michael, and warm up to the idea that imperfection is normal, it's absolutely normal 
normal. And there's going to be books that you're going to buy. It's going to sound like it's the best book in the world. You're going to buy courses, and it's going to sound like you're going to get riches untold. And it's just going to fall into your account. All of that stuff is nonsense. You're going to lose money, and you're going to have losing streaks. And the amount of money, if we could total it all up and look back, it's enormous. But it didn't kill you. It didn't take you out of the game. It did not defeat you. It beat you up a couple times pretty bad. And your ego is bruised for, well, truth be told, I still feel a little pain from it. But you're going to have to accept the fact that losing streaks do occur. Now, it's been a long time since I had 10 losses in a row. But you're going to have those. And there's nothing wrong with it because it helps you, number one, respect risk. Because no one is exempt from being wrong. I still get it wrong, and you're going to get it wrong a lot in the beginning. Prepare for that. Multiple losses does not prove it is broken. Your trading method is not decided in terms of effectiveness if you have a series of losing trades. A series of losing trades is something that every trading methodology will eventually will eventually plague every methodology. There's there is not one single trader that has not endured this. It's a normal thing. But when you experience it and you have to endure it, it feels like it's only you, right, Michael? But it's not just you. Truth is, everyone has it. But the problem is the people online and the people you read about in their books are not not really honest with you. They're going to tell you nothing about their losses. They're not going to say anything about losing money. They're only going to focus on the sweet, sugary-coated chapters of their books that says, this is what I got rich with, and you can too. Stick to the method and risk reduction. When you have your first string of losses, Michael, you're going to want to skip around and try something new. And that's the reason why you bought all those books, because you were looking for the holy grail. And the problem with that is every time you went to a new system, it starts off with modest wins and you fall in love with it and you think you figured it out. And then it goes into a tailspin and you do things the same way that I've outlined in our discussion here and you lose track of what you're doing and lose control of yourself and you enter into a a series of losing trades. Your first impulse is to abandon that method and go to something else. And the problem with that is, is you do this dozens of times. Now, if I could grab you by the lapels and shake you again, it's simply this. Stop bouncing around. Focus with one thing in mind. Work with a higher time frame bias. Work off of one key level. Work off of one market. And stay on one side of the marketplace until proven, obviously, that you're on the wrong side. If you manage your risk, don't force the trades, and you're patient, that alone can be profitable but you have to stick with the method and if you don't reduce the risk when you t- take losses you won't have the ability to stay with the method the method eventually it takes six years for you to figure it out by the way six years you figure out exactly who you are as a trader and it feels like a lifetime It feels like you're never going to get it, Michael. I know. I know how it feels. And I wish I could go back and just tell you to your face, suck it up. Just take it. Because everything changes in your sixth year. Everything changes. It becomes easier. It becomes far less stressful to put the trade on. You know exactly what you're looking for. You know where your stop should be. You know how to manage the stop. You're not over leveraging your account. You're not forcing trades. You grow into yourself in the sixth year. But prior to that sixth year, you're like a wild cowboy. And you just gunsling. And you're not fearful of anything. You take on risk that's much larger than you should. You trade more times than you should. And when you have severe drawdown, it doesn't bother you. And that's a problem. You weren't afraid to do anything. And you weren't afraid... To get into the marketplace with huge leverage where one trade could wipe out the account that's nonsense and you don't need to do that to do well but you have to stick to a method that's very consistent 
that will have losses and you manage your risk. You will be correct more than you're incorrect. It doesn't feel like it now, Michael, but you will be. And the only way that happens is sticking to the method. Sticking to the method, working from the macro down to the micro, and being willing to admit that you're wrong and either taking the loss and going home for the day or changing direction. And in the beginning, it's best if you just take my advice right now, Michael, and just get out of the marketplace and try not to do the reversal because we lose a lot of money doing that too. <laughs> Don't look for others to measure against. You're going to look at other people, other traders, other authors, and you're going to try to say that you want to be like them. And everyone else should not be a measuring stick to you because to have that stunts your growth. You're saying that that person's accomplishments and accolades, you want them. Why? Focus on the ones that you're going to do yourself, the ones that you are going to achieve, those successes and those failures, because they're stories that are going to be significant and meaningful to you. And should anyone sit down with you that has any interest in the marketplace, they're going to be very interested in hearing what you have to say. You have so many adventures ahead of you, Michael, but so much of the pain that we endure was 120% avoidable. So hopefully you've taken my advice here and are going to work towards trying to eliminate some of the pain that we endure. I can tell you as an older man, I'd greatly appreciate it if you would. <laughs> and those of you that were listening, I hope this was also very beneficial and profitable for your learning and development. Until next time, I wish you good luck and good trading.